is Hector Bombay, and he will be telling us about um, time-correlated noise in photon and quantum computation. Can you hear me? Here. Okay, so let me jump directly into the motivation. Uh, so this uh, work grew out of basically curiosity. I mean, it could have some practical applications, but mostly curiosity for me. So if we want to build a quantum computer, we need qubits that are well isolated, so they don't decohere, and that we can control very precisely. Maybe we can find such qubits in nature. Maybe there is some material that can offer them to us, or maybe you, we can carefully engineer such a material. But even if that is not the case, uh, we have a kind of generic solution for like the problem of having only like uh, noisy qubits, which is fault tolerance. Okay, so fault tolerance tells you, okay, if you have qubits that are noisy but just not too noisy, then you can perform arbitrarily complex uh, quantum computations. So the conditions for this to be true. Among the conditions are the fact that not only the noise should be weak, but also it should be weakly correlated in space and time. Okay, this is an important condition. So the purpose of this talk is to discuss the dropping some of these conditions, in particular to consider uh, noise with arbitrary correlations in time. I will be more precise uh, later about what I'm, I mean for that. <coughs> so why I started thinking about this, it was I was thinking about fabrication faults. Okay, so you have some quantum device that is supposed to perform uh, fault around quantum computing, okay? So this device has qubits, connection between these qubits and so on. And if it is fabricated perfectly, you know, maybe then, uh, so the qubits are not too noisy and then it will be able to, to compute properly. Now what happens if, when you make it, like some of the qubits are permanently damaged or some of the links between qubits are permanently damaged and so on? Are there devices that will still continue to perform correctly, okay? That was my kind of curiosity. So, there are different scenarios that we could consider. Maybe we know like uh, where the fabrication faults are. We could probably like test the device or something like that. And then maybe there is some flexibility in how we can operate the device, okay? So how we interact classically with it. So this would be one class of problems. I'm more interested in a different kind here. So for today, I was curious what would happen if we, for some reason, we don't know where the faults are or maybe they change slowly over time or something like that. And what if you know we cannot really change uh, the operation of the system in, or, it, or not enough okay, to, to deal with that? So <clears throat> that was a bit the question. Now this is not maybe a, this is not a very elegant or mathematically very elegant kind of problem, but the thing is that in that kind of situation you will have very strong uh, correlations in times for the faults, right? So if one qubit is permanently damaged, of course it will be faulty all the time and so on. So you can think more generally, okay, what happens if I have this kind of arbitrary correlations uh, in time for, for noise? So this brings me to the issue of what I mean by that, what is the noise model? So I will be considering a stochastic noise, okay? So this is just a toy model that is very useful to understand uh, fault tolerance. Then you can get more sophisticated, but if you are trying something new, it's a good way to do it. So in the stochastic noise models, we start from some uh, ideal circuit, okay? So this big thing here, so this is already the fault tolerance circuit. And <clears throat> so there will be uh, different, uh, different histories, okay? And each of these histories will correspond to a set of faults in the system. So in this case here, uh, well, you can see we have a specific history where some of the uh, locations, meaning uh, some of the gates, are, are faulty, so they don't do what we expect them to do, okay? So there will be some, some adversary if you want, okay, so it's kind of worst-case worst case scenario. Some demon that chooses which, with, with which probability its uh, history of faults will occur and what kind of faults will actually happen in the uh, locations that are faulty, okay? So we are going to constrain the power of this demon by imposing some, uh, some uh, conditions and constraints on the uh, probabilities for each of these histories. So in the conventional case, okay, 
we have local stochastic noise, so this implements this idea of uh, weak correlations in space and time. So we have our quantum circuits with locations, and then the condition is that if I take any number of locations, okay, some fixed number of n locations, then the probability that all of them will fail okay, at the same time, irrespective of what happens to the rest of locations, the probability that these n locations will uh, fail is smaller than lambda to the n, where lambda is the error. Okay? So in this case, we have locations 1 and 5. The probability is smaller than lambda squared. Now, we know that we can do fault tolerance in this case, so this demon is somehow not very powerful. I want to consider a more powerful demon, okay, a homogeneous version. So what I'm going to do is just drop most of the conditions okay, on the probability. So whenever I have locations that occur at different uh, time slices, that condition I drop it. Okay, so I only keep the conditions that involve locations at the same time. So in this case, uh, locations 1 and 3 are in the same time slice. So uh, I have the usual uh, locality condition for them okay, with some error. So this I'm calling spatially local stochastic noise. This is the, the noise model for this. Okay. So the result is that, uh, well, there exists some class, class of codes that have a property called single sort error correction. Okay, it's some, some approach to error correction that I will describe. And quantum memory is based on this uh, scheme turn out to automatically be resilient to uh, this kind of uh, especially local stochastic noise, OK? So they have uh, an error threshold, so we'll discuss later. So that, that's the main result they want to discuss. And OK, so I will start describing a single shot error correction. And I have to start from the beginning. So what is error correction? So in error correction, we want to protect uh, some logical qubits, OK? And we do that by encoding them into a larger Hilbert space. We use many more physical qubits to do that. In doing so, we get many extra degrees of freedom, OK? And we can use these extra degrees of freedom to construct check operators. So these check operators are some commuting observables that have some definite value uh, for encoded states. And then as error happens, uh, the value of these check operators will change, and we can use this information to correct. So in particular, error correction proceeds as follows. First, we measure all these check operators <clears throat> and extract what is called the error syndrome. Okay? Then we classically compute uh, or make a computation with this uh, error syndrome and decide which is the, the error that is or the operation that is more convenient to apply to in order to correct. Okay? And then we apply it. So it's important to distinguish between ideal error correction and noisy error correction. So in the ideal case, we just uh, well, we have some idea circuitry that measures the check operators, then computes classically, and then applies some operator to correct. In the noisy case, we have to be careful because now the check operator measurements themselves are not reliable, and actually the error correction procedure is very sensitive to such errors. So if we don't want to, so if we don't actually want to end up introducing more errors that we started with, we'd better uh, do something to, to make our measurements more reliable, such as, for example, measuring. Uh, several times, okay, and we will need to measure more and more times as we want to get more accuracy. So the single shot uh, error correction, this single shot property that some codes have, is that it is enough a single round of uh, check operator measurements. So for this to be mathematically meaningful, I will ask that <clears throat> the whole operation is uh, quantum local. Okay, by quantum local I mean something analogous to LOCC meaning that I'm allowed uh, local operations, so finite depth quantum circuits, and then arbitrary uh, classical computations. Okay? So in the three stages of error correction, we have that the syndrome extraction and the correction are quantum, so those would be local operations. And then the decoding is classical, so that can be just some global process. So you can already see that since error correction is being performed in a finite time, somehow. Uh, Time-correlated noise will not play such a big role, right? So this already promises to be useful, a useful approach to time-correlated noise. Now, when introducing single error, single sort error correction, <coughs> I have many discussions with colleagues about, like, okay, what do you mean by error correction? Like, what would qualify as error correction? Okay, and to try to answer that, let me show you this figure. So, you know, we have some quantum memory, some quantum, some computation. And some process, OK, so we will have some noisy process. Then we apply error correction, noise error correction. So 
this is how we keep a system uh, kind of uh, how we can so, sorry how we can keep the, so, uh, the system from failing. Okay, so it's kind of a refrigeration. So I like to think in terms of uh, temperature. Okay, so error correction as some refrigeration where we are bringing the temperature down and errors bring this temperature up. So as we have noise in the system, temperature goes up. Then if we could apply ideal error correction, we would bring the temperature to zero, it goes up again, and so on. In reality, error correction is noisy, so we cannot achieve uh, zero temperature, but just some finite temperature, okay? But in, this, in the case of this single sort error correction approach, as the error correction becomes less and less noisy, you're getting closer and closer to zero temperature, okay? So in, in that sense, it approximates uh, ideal error correction, and that's, that's what I mean by it. Okay, so I think this is also suggestive, since you know, everything is about the temperature that can be very low, Somehow it seems that uh, time correlation should not play a big role. Okay. And then there could be other approaches to error correction, but I'm not discussing that today. So the codes that have this uh, single sort property are topological codes. Topological codes, or a class of topological codes. Topological codes were introduced by Kitaev, and they have three main characteristics. So the physical qubits are placed on a lattice. Could be a two-dimensional lattice like this one in the figure, or three-dimensional, and so on. Then, importantly, the check operators are local. So this means that we are going to perform measurements that only involve a few qubits in, a, in some neighborhood. Okay, and this, from a practical point of view, is very important, and is part of the reason why these codes are popular. The last uh, characteristic of topological codes is that they have something called local indistinguishability. So if I have some large lattice, okay, I don't depict the qubits there. But I have access only to some uh, region of the system <coughs> that is uh, small compared to the system size, then <coughs> any operator with support in that region will not be able to tell me anything about uh, encoded information. Okay? So these are kind of the basic characteristics. Now what I want to do is to start with uh, two-dimensional codes and show you why time-correlated noise will kill them. Okay? And then later we, I will show like why the same kind of reasoning doesn't hold for these codes with a single sort error correcting property. So in two dimensions, errors can be visualized as uh, having the shape of strings, and the, the error syndromes correspond to the endpoints of these strings. So for example, here I have, so this is a surface, yeah, there are two boundaries, and I have some qubits here that suffered an error, so I can visualize that some string, and the syndrome for that error will correspond to, so will be some a uh, check operator here that lives in the bond in the endpoint of that of that string. Okay, so these things are not very important. Uh, what will matter here is that in order to keep it, this kind of uh, codes or systems uh, without errors, what we can do is just keep track of where these uh, endpoints, these particles, as we like to think of them, are. Okay, so we just so here I'm depicting so this is a space-time picture. So one space-time dimension and time goes up. And the idea is that we are going to measure regularly the system and uh, record the uh, check operator outcome, okay? <clears throat> and this in general will be faulty. So here, for example, so okay, so this, these word lines here are the actual word lines caused by errors affecting the physical qubits. And the outcomes, are the, uh, the outcomes of check operator measurements are depicted here. So these green ones are correct outcomes, these red ones are wrong. So in this case, the red dot was that there was a particle here, but there is not. In this case here, we didn't, uh, the check so the, the measurement didn't tell us that there was a particle here, but in, actually there was, so there is also a fault, and so on. So if we can uh, keep track of particles in this way well enough, uh, the system will not suffer from logical errors. Okay? Now, I would like our demo to Full us completely, okay? So to, for the demo to have a strategy so that we don't see absolutely no syndromes coming out in the system, and yet the demon is able to introduce a logical error, okay? With certainty or with high probability. So the kind of processes that the demon will consider are such as the one depicted here. So, uh, so if you manage to move, so these are, this is the system, there are two boundaries. If you manage to move a particle from end to end, you will introduce a logical error. And you can do this step by step by, you know, here I apply some, uh, some maybe a bit flip or something like that to a physical qubit. Then I create a particle. Okay. Then I apply another. Well, 
Then I, we measure, okay, but uh, if there is a fault at that uh, measurement, we will not see any particle. Then we move, or the daemon applies another error to move the particle again, so extending the string. Again, there should be a particle there, but we will not detect it because the daemon will introduce, introduce a fault uh, in the same place. Okay, so at every step in time in this process, we have a single uh, fault, okay, and all in all, uh, we get a logical error at the, in the end uh, <coughs> of the process. So this in itself is not, uh, that will not satisfy obviously, uh, so if we just apply this with probability one, it will not satisfy the constraints of special local noise, but what the demon can do is, so lambda is zero rate, remember? Uh, so at every time step, it could as, the demon could start such a process with probability lambda, okay? And if the demon does so, uh, you can see that, for example, in this time slice, okay, what is the probability that I have a fault here and a fault here? Well, it will be uh, lambda squared, okay? So it will satisfy this especially uh, locality uh, conditions. And in fact, it's a Markovian process, interestingly. Um, okay, so this means that in, you know, within some uh, linear time in the system size, uh, the memory will be damaged. And in fact, this can be improved to make it a finite time. So no matter how large the system is, it will take a finite time to kill, to kill it, to damage it for the demo. And we will not see anything happening, okay? So I think this is pretty bad. Okay, so it is possible to escape these kind of problems and with single sort of correcting codes. And they come in two flavors, okay? Some of them uh, require at least four special dimensions and others can work in three special dimensions. So let's see a bit how it works. So in the 4D case, the key is that instead of having uh, error, uh, string-like errors, now they are membranes, so that the syndrome, which corresponds to the boundary of the membranes, are not point-like, okay, but now it's going to be loop-like. So the thing is this, is that if the demo was trying to use a similar strategy, so remember, uh, He's trying for us not to detect like anything happening, right? So he's creating a, so here time goes up again and he's creating a membrane that is larger and larger as it becomes larger. So here at this step, the demon has to hide all this uh, syndrome here, all the boundary, right? And he will only be able to do that with a exponentially small probability. Then the demon could play with entropy and so on, but it's possible to see that he will not succeed. Okay, so uh, for lambda small enough, for small enough error rate, uh, he will never be able to introduce with high probability uh, logical errors. Okay. So the 3D case is kind of more fun because in this case, errors are still string-like and the syndrome still takes the form of, of particles, okay? Are just the endpoints of these strings. And yet, the uh, demon cannot play its game. So what will happen now is that, uh, for some reason that I'm going to explain, it is not enough, so remember, the demon has to hide from us the fact that there's a particle here, there's a particle here, and so on. Before, it was enough, in the 2D case, to introduce a fault here, okay, right at the measurement. But now, he will have to introduce faults connecting that particle all the way down to the boundary of the system, okay? So because of this, he will again have some very small probability allowed to do that, okay? So some exponential suppression, and we will be safe. So the strategy will not work. So how, can this, how is this possible? Well, it requires using subsystem codes. So in subsystem codes, I said before that in, er, in error correcting codes, we are using extra degrees of freedom in order to introduce check operators, but what we can also do is not use all the available degrees of freedom, but rather reserve some, maybe most of them, as so-called gates degrees of freedom, okay? So gates degrees of freedom are just degrees of freedom in principle we don't care about, but turn out to be uh, very useful, okay? So one way in which they can be useful is uh, we can measure them instead of the check operators and infer from these measurements. So measure the gates, degrees of freedom, degrees, uh, the gates, uh, degrees of freedom to obtain some sort of gate syndrome, and from that gate syndrome infer what is the error syndrome. Okay, so do it indirectly, and this is useful. So I want to give a physical picture of how that is useful. So you know Gauss law; it tells us that. Uh, the total amount of charge in some region of a space 
is directly related to the flux of the corresponding uh, field uh, through the uh, boundary of this uh, space region. Okay. So, in the uh, codes that have the single cell property, uh, which are three gauge color codes, charge or yeah, charge uh, or ch the role charge is played by error syndrome. Okay. So these are the these particles. Okay. And the role of the field is played by the gate, the gate syndrome. So now, instead of measuring directly the charge, we are going to measure the field, and from the field infer where, what are the charges. We can do that through the Gauss law, right? But if we do that, here's what will happen. Okay, so I'm, going, I'm giving here a two-dimensional picture. So suppose that the demon wants to fake the amount of charge in this point. Okay, so I can draw many regions like that, okay, and if the charge is going to be different, this means that for any, each of these uh, surfaces, okay, or like boundaries, I will need to have some uh, fake uh, elect, uh, field going through that, uh, that boundary of the region, right? So this will be true for any one. So the thing is that I need to introduce, or the demon needs to introduce some fake uh, flux of the field, okay, connecting the uh, particle or the charge to the boundary of the system. So that's kind of the trick. Actually, how much time do I have? Oh, to me. So just to give you an impression of how it works in, in practice, in the gauge color codes. So these codes are defined on a simplicial lattice. Uh, qubits live in the uh, simplices, OK? So in the tetrahedra. Uh, and then there are color vertices and color links. The check operators correspond to the vertices. Okay, so these are at every vertex we could have a particle or not, and they are colored. And the gates operators, okay, that we are going to to measure to recover the gate syndrome correspond to links, and they are also colored. So, without maybe going into details, or maybe I can go into some details. So, the idea is that well, on the uh, whenever I have uh, an odd number, so given any color combination, if I have an odd number of links of such a color ending uh, at a vertex, then for a given like gauge syndrome, then that will be, uh, I will know that there is a, an error syndrome at that vertex. Okay. So there is this kind of relationship that is uh, the same as in the, <coughs> as in the case of electric uh, charge. And not by chance, because here there is some underlying also uh, gauge field theory that I will not talk about. Right. So I like to emphasize that what is happening here is some sort of confinement. Okay. So in these three-dimensional codes, there is a big difference between measuring check operators or measuring gauge operators. So if I just go ahead and measure directly the check operators, now so the demon can very easily introduce say two particles that are far away, which is kind of damaging. So the cost for him to fake measurements here and here is just lambda squared, okay? There is just two locations. On the other hand, if we measure gauge operators, for the demo to fake two charges, it will now to introduce faults all along the flux lines connecting these two guys, okay? So as the distance between these charges uh, increases, the probability for such a thing will decrease uh, exponentially okay, with the distance. And that I'm calling confinement. I think it's pretty fair. Good. So finally, let me be a bit more precise about what is the result in the paper. So I'm considering just quantum memories. Okay? And so as I said before, so a quantum memory would be just uh, concatenation of like some noise and error correction, noise error correction, and so on. So we are not doing anything, no computation at all. And in order to evaluate how good the memory is, we just sandwich the whole process between a perfect encoding and a perfect decoding and ask, OK, how close is the total process to the identity? OK. So in particular, for the noisy part, I just have, in the ideal case, the identity applied to each qubit, and then the usual, or like especially local noise with some uh, error rate lambda, okay? And for the noisy error correction, turns out that qualitatively is enough to consider uh, 
measurement errors, okay? So I again have like especially local constraints on them for some other parameter eta, okay? So I have these two parameters. And now I just concatenate you know, noise and correction any number of times t. And the result is that as long as the error rates lambda and eta are small enough, the probability that this whole thing uh, will, uh, will, will introduce an error is smaller than this, where a and b are both exponentially suppressed as I increase the, the system size. Okay, so just what you would expect. All right. So with that, I wrap up. So, okay, I haven't said anything about computation, but in 3D gates color codes, uh, basically all the gates are transversal with the caveat that you need to do some uh, kind of error correction operations, but they all can be done in this kind of single sort way, so I don't expect uh, any difficulties in uh, achieving uh, you know, universal computation through this kind of scheme for this kind of noise. Then I think an interesting issue is whether we really need uh, three special dimensions. So for local stochastic noise, there is no such a constraint about dimensionality. So even in one dimension, you can do uh, fault tolerance without problems. So it's interesting, you know, in this case, for uh, this kind of time correlated noise, is there such, such a constraint that has to do with dimension, space dimension? I don't know. Another important problem is uh, what happens when I do not know where my fabrication falls. So it's a completely different, or very different kind of problem that, of course, uh, will have a different kind of solution. Uh, well, I said before that the error correction that I'm considering uses global classical operations of what happens if I restrict myself to local computations to some sort of cellular automaton based error correction. And for me, the most interesting is, uh, the most interesting thing is what is the physics of uh, 3D gauge color codes? Okay, so if I construct Hamiltonians related to them, you know, what kind of phases can I get? And most, maybe most importantly, is it possible to recover some sort of confinement? with some sort of generalization of these of this, uh, color codes. Uh, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Hector. We have time for some questions. Hi, Hector. So at one point you said uh, something like topological codes are the kind of codes where we see single shot error correction. Oh, no. Right? No, I, no, I didn't mean that. I can't I mean, remember the exact remark. I mean that, no, just the single shot error correction codes that I know are topological. Yeah, so the follow-up is, <laughs> have you uh, made any progress thinking what non-topological constructions of codes with single shot error correction might exist? As if, if I was trying, <laughs> no, no. Is no. there any indication of how you might do it in a way that's not topological, like some LDPC codes or something? Well, you mean if you could do similar things with LDPC codes? Yes, definitely, but uh, I have not thought about it. Like if it is like really in the same kind of powerful way, no, I don't know. Are there more questions? Um, in, in some cases, even if there isn't intrinsically time correlated noise, you, you, it might be possible to have an effective description where time correlations appear. So in topological codes, I'm not sure uh, if the same sort of thing would arise. But in, in some things I've looked at, if you're doing, say, Steen uh, syndrome extraction in a regular CSS code, um, rather than treating the the measurements as as being uh, as having errors, you can effectively commute those errors out of the 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 syndrome extraction circuit, and they become correlated errors that happen before and after the circuit. So in the, in a case like that. You, you've got a picture that where, where suddenly time correlation has appeared in your, in your 
uh, noise model. Um, but you know what kind of time correlations you would expect in a case like that. So if you have some knowledge of uh, uh, what type of time correlations you, you know, are allowed and then other ones are considered f still forbidden, um, presumably that would give you greater power in being able to correct errors. No, absolutely. And uh, I mean, the thing is that the kind of Time correlated noise that will appear effectively in any case will be weakly correlated, right? right. So it's it's kind of qualitatively different. So I guess I was trying to answer a different kind of or a different kind of curiosity because from a practical perspective, that kind of emergent or effective uh, time correlations I don't think they are so damaging. Thank you. So do you know if uh, single shot error correction necessarily has a negative impact on either the threshold or the overhead? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. So do you have estimate for the threshold? <laughs> I, I have no, nothing like that. So if there are no more questions, let's thank Hector and all the speakers of this session.